Amen. Hello, church. Just getting situated here using some of this new technology. Hopefully that will do. Great. Okay. So, um, so glad again that you've joined us today. Um, you know, on top of the, the many difficult months and weeks that we have all shared, uh, to be honest with you, this has been a particularly difficult week. Uh, many of us, or most of us, have heard that Pastor Arlene and Paolo uh, are struggling with COVID. Uh, Pastor Arlene is at Sunnybrook, and uh, Paolo is now home. And, um, and uh, Arlene's recently received word that she might be able to go home in a few days, depending how her oxygen is. We do want to continue to be in prayer for both of them, just continuing to try God for their healing and um, and you know we, we've known the pandemic is real um, sadly there are there are some who seem to, to to need to personally experience something before they believe it's real the reality is uh, anyone with kind of their eyes open have known that that the pandemic is real and and but um, uh, you know it, it's it's brought home closer to us when uh, people that we know and love are, are struggling with it. Um, you know, so just to be honest with you up front, as I was preparing this message, I was doing so with a heavy heart uh, for the suffering that, you know, the people that we really care for are, are enduring and recognizing that many are suffering as well. Um, uh, you know, much of life includes suffering, um, but when it does hit close to home, you know, uh, we become really aware of it. You know, we become unavoidably attuned to the reality of suffering and and the truth is that suffering can drive us closer to God or further from God we can allow suffering either that we experience or that we see others experience we can allow that to raise doubts uh, or to reinforce doubts that we generally carry or we can press into God we can um, you know we can we can kind of we can run away from who we are as the people of God when we face a hard news or we can run into who we are and, um, and so, you know, that's our choice. And, and today I choose to run into God and together we choose to draw near together to God and to gather, to worship him and to adore him because he's completely worthy of that and, and to listen to his word. And, and I pray that I would faithfully convey his heart through his word today. So I want to encourage you to open your Bible today. If you haven't already, it's just a good practice to, to always have your Bible there. And we are in Acts chapter 1. Acts follows the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we have the book of Acts. And we are at uh, chapter 1. And in the book of Acts, we have a, uh, a tremendous kind of sequel to the Gospels. Uh, it is the sequel or the follow-up to the book of Luke. Um, it's the same uh, writer, the same basic perspective. Um, and then he is talking about what really happens next. I'm just going to enlarge myself a little bit here. I realize I'm a little bit smaller than necessary. There we go. And um, yeah, and so, so it's the same writer. And of course, the, the book of Acts is about what happens next uh, after Jesus was here on this planet, after he taught us uh, the, the mind and the heart of God, after he showed us the way of God and, and showed us precisely what God would be like if he were a human, because he was a human, God in the flesh with us. And then he went to the cross to suffer for us. And then he was resurrected. And so Acts is about what happens next, about what the Holy Spirit does who was sent by Jesus to the disciples, what the Holy Spirit does in the early church. And the Holy Spirit uh, was to do much uh, in and through the, the disciples who were shortly to become known as the apostles. And, and actually, you know, Jesus uh, prepares us for, um, for what's coming in terms of the, what's coming with the coming of the Holy Spirit near the end of his ministry. He says this, he says, um, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And if you think about that, that's kind of mind boggling given who Jesus is and was and all that he did. Um, but God's greater kingdom work that would reach throughout the ages, uh, ever since Jesus to this very moment, would be accomplished through the followers of Jesus. You're here watching this today and you're serving the Lord today, um, or you're, you're receiving blessing from being connected to, to the church of Jesus because some follower of Jesus pointed you or someone you know to Jesus. And, and, um, and, and that 
has this, that line comes all the way back from Jesus uh, and to the commission that he gave the early apostles, you know, and in one very real sense, we are all beggars telling other beggars where to find bread uh, in, in that sense of uh, we, we have received grace and, uh, and in humility, we've, re we've received that, that love and that grace from Jesus. And so we have this book of Acts. Um, and in this book of Acts, we have this wonderful, uh, exciting adventure of the, pi the pioneers of our faith, the pioneers of our faith. In a sense, they were kind of like the early versions of us. They were the first Christians. And I've always been impressed how the, you know, the very humble um, kind of stumbling disciples that we see in the gospel narratives became the bold, uh, courageous, well-spoken apostles of the early church as recorded in the book of Acts. Have you ever wondered about that? Well, the reason is hinted at in this passage, although Rob Jin is actually going to be exploring this in more depth next Sunday. It has to do with the transforming power of God working in us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us to deal maturely with suffering to navigate its impact on our lives, to navigate its impact on our bodies, our emotions. Um, and the sending of the Holy Spirit that we see here in the first couple of chapters of the book of Acts is an extraordinary gift that we all need to be aware of at all times, really. And we also need to, 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 to treasure the presence of the Holy Spirit in this earthen vessel, because the scripture tells us that, the, that we are the, 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 the temple of the Holy Spirit, individually and collectively as the body of Christ, as a church. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is another Another amazing thing, honestly. Um, so today we're actually looking at Jesus' final words on earth to the disciples after the resurrection, after his appearances to many. Did you know that Jesus didn't just appear to a couple people, uh, just to the disciples? Um, that is, so his appearances were not limited to the disciples. The book of Corinthians tells us that Jesus actually appeared after his resurrection to upwards of 500 people. It says in, um, in 1 Corinthians, uh, he was buried. Uh, he, he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. And we find that in 1 Corinthians. And so in verses uh, five, or verses one to five of chapter one, Luke actually talks about his whole, re Luke is the author of the gospel of Luke, obviously, and Luke talks about his reason for writing this book, the book of Acts. And let's just uh, quickly look at that. He says, uh, in the former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, uh, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then we have uh, verse six, which is what Teresa uh, read. I was so happy that Teresa was able to join us. Uh, that was actually pre-recorded, uh, and uh, Teresa filmed that in in um, in Poland. And so we're super happy, Teresa, to have you with us uh, all all across the the big pond there called the Atlantic Ocean, and that you were with us. So here in verse six, uh, it says they gathered around Jesus and they asked him, Lord. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So right up to this moment in time, even after Jesus had been resurrected, the disciples were still confused. I remember at Jesus' uh, crucifixion, they had all been uh, shocked. They were deeply disappointed. Jesus had told them, he'd given them multiple heads up that, that what happened at the crucifixion was going to happen. But nevertheless, when it came about and it happened, they were all uh, deeply disappointed. Uh, each of the male disciples, except for John, abandoned Jesus. Only the woman remained at the cross. Uh, generally speaking, a woman had a better grasp of what was going on throughout the entire gospel narrative. Uh, we just find that and, and uh, we see that as we just sort of read the text. Um, so the disciples had, had been confused, but then uh, only uh, quite recently, you know, they've been specifically confused because he was dead and how was that to have led to anything? But then they discovered that Jesus was alive. He had been resurrected from the dead. He had triumphed over death. 
And as familiar as we may be with that story, um, this was mind boggling news for the disciples truly mind-boggling, and they're still trying to wrap their heads around who Jesus is. And so we see here in verse 6 uh, that the disciples still kind of aren't getting it, um, or perhaps what we can say is that is that they're getting it as well as any human being could without the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given at this point, and so minus the presence of the Holy Spirit in them, the disciples are really thinking about kind of temporal earthly things. Uh, they're actually kind of focused on politics. They're looking for a restoration uh, of, the, of the political and religious kingdom of Israel. Um, and so, you know, so their hopes are still misplaced. And that's where we find the disciples at in this, in this verse. And then in, um, in the next couple of verses, uh, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has sent by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and then in all Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of all the earth. So it's interesting, Jesus kind of almost disregards this question about the restoration of the kingdom, largely because the disciples need to understand that Jesus did not come to be the Lord of any earthly kingdom in the way that they were thinking. Um, you know, and Jesus says the Father alone knows when things are going to happen, and more importantly, uh, a whole lot of other stuff is going to happen. That earthly kingdom uh, that's perhaps not happening for a very long time, maybe not even until the new earth, the new heaven spoken about in the book of Revelation uh, happens. Uh, so that's not happening. The way they're thinking is not going to kind of come to fruition, but but the, the closer, more important kingdom, that kingdom where God himself reigns in his people is closer than the disciples imagine. And so Jesus basically says here, you know, here's what matters. <laughs> you will be chained, changed. You will be changed. You will be transformed. You will receive a new power that you have never known before. And that transformation you will receive from the hand of God will lead you to being witnesses to everyone, everywhere. That will be your reason for being disciples, soon to be called apostles or sent ones. And so that's kind of how Jesus reorients their thinking again. They kind of start with this worldly idea of, um, of what to kind of expect next, that Jesus has been resurrected. Okay, so we can look hope, hope for the establishment of an earthly kingdom or the reestablishment of, frankly, something old. And Jesus says, nope, nope, that's not happening. Something way better is happening. And then in verse 9, uh, it says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. So this is Jesus, and this, this uh, picture here is an illustration. It's actually one of hundreds, if not thousands, of illustrations. You can just Google it on, on, um, on, on Google, Google Images. Uh, it is a, a, a whitish-looking Jesus. Of course, we know Jesus was, uh, you know, a Palestinian, darker skin, probably shorter. Um, but this is just an image that's there. Um, and, and, and so here, in verse 9, we have the ascension itself. Again, portrayed all kinds of different ways uh, visually. And so in dramatic fashion, it appears Jesus departs. And then he who had been so plainly visible to them uh, before the, the, the crucifixion, um, at the crucifixions, horribly kind of dying on the cross, and then post-crucifixion at the resurrection, he who had been so plainly visible to them became obscured by a cloud, it indicates. A cloud hid them from their sight. But that obscurity or that kind of cloaking of Jesus would not last as the disciples would be given eyes to see through the Holy Spirit and hearts to believe and power to proclaim the truth of the gospel. Very, very important stuff. In verse 10, it says they were looking intently up to the sky as he was going. And then suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. So the disciples were like really impressed. They were stunned by this spectacle. They're, 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 they're looking, they're staring up intently at the sky and, and, and they're just like, wow, what is this? And then interestingly, the angels kind of bring them back down to earth. The angels bring them back down to earth. And they say in verse 11, uh, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? <laughs> this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you have seen him go into heaven. 
And so that, I think, is a word for us and for the whole church. See, the ascension was an important part of Jesus' journey, and, and it, it, it actually kind of really marks the precise moment that his work on this earth, directly by him, was completed. And so he returned at that moment to where he had always dwelt before the incarnation, before he was born as a baby and, and lived as a human. Uh, he returned to where he had always dwelt, at the right hand of the Father, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, but, but as much as we, we do and we should uh, want to cast our eyes and our hearts to heaven as we worship the living God, we actually, I would suggest, need to spend at least as much time, if not more time, kind of not looking into the sky. But rather, now that the Holy Spirit has been sent, and again, we're going to learn more about that next week. Now that the Holy Spirit has been sent, uh, establishing his church, which you as a follower of Jesus are part of, we need to have our heart and our mind set on being his church, simply being his church. So we too are called to be witnesses. When I first heard that, that kind of terrified me many moons ago. Um, every year I get a little bit more excited about this idea because, because it has something to do with uh, genuinely being who we are and, and, and kind of becoming more fully who we are intended to be. Uh, so we too are called to be witnesses through our actions, through our words, uh, through our testimony and experience of the glory of the resurrected Jesus. Now, I, I do want to circle back to something that, that, I, that I mentioned earlier in John 14. Let me see if I, do I have that? Yeah. So it's, Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So those who believe are called to obey. Of course. And those who believe and obey are part of doing the work of the kingdom of God here on earth. You know, Jesus' public ministry lasted like three years, not a long time. Three years ago was 2017. A lot's happened since then, obviously. But, but his public ministry lasted three years. The church has been here. Um, you know, uh, uh, the better, so actually the church, which for the, for the most part has been kind of working in the background, uh, you know, humble people of God, never seeking, never obtaining recognition, simply doing the work of the kingdom, uh, fulfilling their destinies as each has loved their neighbor, um, has struggled uh, to love their enemy and, and been an active witness to the reality of God and to the love of Jesus Christ and to the glory of gospel, of the gospel. And so in verse, verse 11, the angels say that Jesus is returning the same way that he left. And elsewhere in the New Testament, there's quite a few mentions of the return of Jesus. And, and, um, but the, the way that it's mentioned is never about scaring us. It's always about encouraging or having us encourage one another and being encouraged ourselves and being encouraged to remain ready and uh, to, to, to continue in the faith, uh, to be faithful lovers of God, faithful witnesses to Jesus. And, and that's simply because, again, Jesus is returning. Um, there is a great harvest of souls yet to enter into the kingdom of God. And you and I are the harvesters that he is called to kind of bring in the wheat. Some of us who go back a ways, there's an old hymn, bringing in the sheaves. It sounds really out of date now. Nowadays, but, but the idea is that there's this harvest and God wants us to be part of bringing in that harvest. And, and, and so what that really kind of amounts to is the fact that, uh, you know, everything you do when you're by yourself, when you're with your family, when you're out in the community, everything, everything matters. Some of you know that I was uh, raised kind of with no faith at all. I was raised an atheist. I was raised and I was convinced that absolutely nothing mattered. And then I become a Christian and I discovered the polar opposite is true. You know, everything matters. Everything, uh, you know, that I do, that I say uh, matters. And that's a really important uh, kind of just reality to kind of just accept and, um, and to, to really wrap our brains around. And, and so, so, so you're either being shaped to be more and more like Jesus right now, 
or you are being activated and mobilized by Jesus to do his kingdom work of seeking the lost and pursuing his justice and love. And actually, often he both shapes us and mobilizes us at the same time. Remember when I first wanted to get um, involved in ministry, um, a pastor, I've been a Christian for about five years, and the pastor just said, uh, you're not ready. You're not really ready. You're not really ready. Um, mind you, a year later, same pastor actually said, go to Evergreen, go to the mission, and, and you're probably ready. Anyhow, so we're never really ready in one sense, um, and, and maybe uh, we shouldn't ever really feel ready. I know that I have never felt ready for anything that I've been asked to do or anything I've done, frankly. Um, you know, uh, when you don't feel ready, when you don't feel prepared, you tend to cleave to Jesus. You cling to him for dear life as you go about doing good, and that's actually a really good thing. That's how you stay healthy. That's how you thrive as you fulfill that call of Jesus on your life. And as we do that collectively as the body of Christ. So may each of us say yes to this call, this call that Jesus prepared us to fulfill when, when he gave another sober message. And, and I want to kind of wrap with this. Um, this is from Matthew 16. Je uh, Jesus said this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So this We've talked about before, you know, um, denying yourself simply means denying those things that you want to do that don't honor God, that are an offense to God, taking up your cross, which is kind of embracing whatever suffering may be in your life at the moment, and then just following Jesus every day, renewing your commitment to follow Jesus. So Jesus is coming, absolutely, with a reward for what each of us has done with our lives uh, toward loving and worshiping and honoring God. And so may we be ready, uh, may we become ready if we kind of feel like we're not ready. And again, if we don't feel like we're ready, uh, let that be the thing that causes us to cleave unto Jesus. I have a little grandson and one of the most fun things about, about Stevie who's turning nine months very soon is he, 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 um, he's often quite independent, but then he kind of comes and he just cleaves to you, he hangs on to you. He particularly does that with his mom and with his dad, but as grandparents, we are the, the joyful recipients of that sometimes too. Uh, God wants us to cleave to him, you know? and and. and and if the whole thing kind of seems too much, if all this talk about, you know, being part of God, harvesting for his kingdom and being part of like an active um, participant in the kingdom of God, if that seems just kind of too big right now, um, then I would encourage you to do what I do. You know, I, I pray for God to give you his heart and to give you his passion for people because God loves people. And, and pray for God to give you the courage to step outside of what is comfortable for you and, and, and into that interaction with that other person. You know, so you have that opportunity to be salt and to be light. Pray uh, for God to prepare your heart to be a part of this uh, kind of community of harvesters. Um, and I would also encourage you to become addicted to spending time in God's presence. Over the, over the pandemic and maybe a little before that, I kind of have become addicted to spending time in God's presence. I really look forward to it. Uh, you know, like spend time in the morning or whenever you're, you're really alert, give God, give God the kind of the first fruits of your energy and your brain power uh, in worship or in reading his word, in confession, and really, really importantly also in praying for the blessing of God upon other people. That's, I think, where we really kind of unite our hearts hearts with God's heart and we allow the things that break the heart of God to also break our hearts but we do so in companionship and in, in union and in submission to the living God. Pray for the Holy Spirit's power uh, to be the person that God needs you to be um, to do those things that will accomplish his will in your life and when you pray that uh, sincerely because the Holy Spirit is real and because the Holy Spirit dwells in you as you are a follower of Jesus and trusting in his sacrifice for your sins, you will be surprised at how everything in you comes alive. Amen. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Matthew, for that great message of encouragement. And I just want to remind everybody that we do worship 
a triune God. We have 